Often the diagnosis is very easy. One of the characteristic features of myasthenia is the fatigability, the variability of the weakness during the day and from day to day. The presentation with variable drooping of the eyelids and intermittent double vision is highly characteristic of myasthenia and will allow the diagnosis to be suspected very strongly at first presentation. In some patients the clinical history isn't quite so clear and in all patients we rely on additional tests to prove the diagnosis. The easiest test and indeed one of the most specific tests is simply to take a blood sample and to look for the antibodies that cause myasthenia. And in 85% of people with generalised myasthenia, we will identify the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody. In the remaining 15%, in about half of them, we will identify the anti-mask antibody. And if the blood test shows the presence of those antibodies, that confirms the diagnosis of myasthenia. But a proportion of patients don't have those antibodies, and so we can't rely on them for diagnosis. The test that is most useful in that situation is a test called EMG, or electromyography. Now that is very complicated, but simply a nerve is stimulated with an electrical generator and the response in the muscle connected to that nerve is measured. And in myasthenia, as the nerve is stimulated, the response to the muscle fatigues. The response gradually gets smaller and smaller. There is a variant of that technique called single fiber EMG, which is a very useful technique in patients with ocular myasthenia. The problem in ocular myasthenia is that tests in the arms and legs show no abnormality. Single fiber EMG allows us to look at the muscles of the face. We don't actually look at the eye muscles, but we look at the muscles very close to the eyes in the cheeks and over the forehead. And that will show a characteristic response in myasthenia. It is not 100% sensitive, but it is positive in most patients who have ocular myasthenia. There's a third test which is very well known, but is actually of limited use, and that's the test called the Tensilon test. So in the Tensilon test, you're given an injection, and we look at a weak muscle, for example, a drooping eyelid. And within 30 seconds or so of injecting the Tensilon, the muscle will improve in strength, the eyes will open, but it doesn't last for very long. It lasts for a minute or two, and then everything goes back to how it was. But it's particularly useful in people who've got ocular myasthenia, in whom the antibody tests are negative, and in whom electromyography has not given a clear-cut response. But it must be interpreted with caution. There are four basic approaches to treatment. The first treatment that everybody with myasthenia is given is a drug called pyridostigmine. If we return to our diagram again, you will remember the enzyme cholinesterase that destroys the acetylcholine. Pyridostigmine is a drug that can be taken as a tablet which blocks the enzyme. And in the vast majority of patients with myasthenia, pyridostigmine will lead to an improvement in strength. In a few patients, the response is excellent and they need no other treatment. But in the majority of people, although it is a very, very useful drug, it doesn't completely rid them of their symptoms. And we then need to move on to other forms of treatment. So pyridostigmine is a symptomatic treatment. It eases the weakness, but it doesn't tackle the underlying disease process. I always say it's a little bit like a patient with a headache due to a brain tumour. If you give them paracetamol, the headache will go away, but the tumour doesn't. Pyridostigmine eases the weakness of myasthenia, but doesn't get rid of the underlying problem. So if pyridostigmine isn't adequate treatment, then the next stage of treatment is immunosuppression. And that's to use drugs that suppress the body's immune system to, let, to make it stop producing the antibodies that cause the myasthenia. And the most important immunosuppressant drug is prednisolone, which is also known as a steroid. And prednisolone is very effective in treating myasthenia. It is rather slow to work. It takes a few months to have optimal effect. And the problem with steroids is that they can cause long-term side effects. The more that you're on, the longer that you take it for, the more risks there are of problems. There are some short-term side effects which people find very distressing and inconvenient, such as weight gain, acne, mood change, insomnia. 
but it is the long-term side effects that cause us the greatest concern. Perhaps the most important of those is osteoporosis, thinning of the bones. And that is such an important issue that when patients are started on prednisolone, we also start them on other drugs to protect their bones. Now, because of those problems, we use other immunosuppressant drugs. And there are several drugs available that suppress the immune system, as does prednisolone, but work in a different way. And they don't have the same side effects as the prednisolone. Many of these drugs were introduced for the treatment of patients who'd had organ transplants. When somebody has a, a kidney transplant, for example, the body recognises the kidney as being foreign and produces antibodies against it. And so people who've had a transplant require lifelong immunosuppressant treatment. And we are using similar drugs to those used for patients with organ transplants. The drug that's been most widely studied is a drug called azathioprine. And we normally use that in combination with prednisolone when treating people with generalised myasthenia. Azathioprine lowers the amount of prednisolone that people need in the long term. So if somebody is taking azathioprine, they need less prednisolone than they would do otherwise. And so sometimes we refer to these drugs as steroid sparing drugs. There's a third form of treatment which is helpful for some patients, but not all. And that's a treatment called thymectomy. The thymus gland is a small gland that sits just behind the breastbone and in childhood is very important in establishing the immune system. But in normal individuals from about the age of two onwards, it seems to do nothing. But we have good evidence that in some patients with myasthenia, the thymus is involved either in causing the disease or potentiating the immune response that causes the myasthenia. And we've known for a long time that some patients who have the thymus gland removed the myasthenia improves, but not everybody. Now, on the evidence that we have available to date, we think that the people who are most likely to benefit from thymectomy are people who are under the age of 45, who've got generalised myasthenia rather than just ocular myasthenia, who've got anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies in their blood, and who have had the disease for only a relatively short period of time, perhaps a year or two. In that group, we think that about one in four people who have a thymectomy, the disease will go into remission. It will settle spontaneously and they will not need any further drugs for treating the condition. In about 50% of people who have a thymectomy, it improves the condition, but they still require drug treatment. And in the remaining quarter, about one in four patients, the operation seems to be of no benefit at all. There's a fourth form of treatment which isn't a long-term treatment, but which is very useful for people if they have a severe exacerbation of their myasthenia, or if when they first present the weakness is very severe. I would call this immunomodulation because it modulates the immune system rather than completely suppressing it. The oldest of these treatments is a treatment called plasma exchange. And what we do is we put a small plastic tube, a cannula, into the vein in the groin it's left there for five days, and each day for five days, blood is removed, the antibodies are washed off, and the red blood cells are returned to the patient. So you don't become anemic, uh, but it gets rid of the antibodies that are causing the disease. And within a week, the myasthenia will start to improve. Removing the antibodies leads to a very rapid improvement in the strength. But unfortunately, it only lasts for about six to eight weeks. More recently, we've been using another form of treatment called intravenous immunoglobulin. Blood from blood donors is pulled together and the antibodies are removed. They're taken away from the red cells and a concentrated solution of antibodies is made. The patient is then given those antibodies by a drip into a vein in the arm once a day for five days. And through mechanisms that we don't fully understand, that very high dose of antibodies interferes with the antibodies that cause the myasthenia. And the effects are very similar to plasma exchange. A response within a week or so but a response that only lasts between six and eight weeks. But when the myasthenia is severe, these are very useful treatments for improving the strength and allow time for the steroids and other drugs to become effective. Well, all these drugs and treatments may sound rather horrific, but the good news is that with these treatments, we would expect to get you back to normal or near enough normal. It's not going to be a fast process. It's going to take many months for the drugs to become fully effective. 
But at the end of the day, we would expect the strength to return to normal. The inconvenience that you will have is needing to take the drugs every day. And as I've mentioned, the drugs can have side effects. Now, hopefully those side effects will be tolerable. Thank you very much, David. I hope you found that useful and uh, now know where you can find out more. And don't forget that the MGA is dedicated to supporting care, education and research around the myasthenias. We've tried to make this CD-ROM as user-friendly as possible. If you want to get back to the front page to view something else, just click on the Home button.